In our gospel today, Jesus tells us that he has come to set the earth on fire. He even says that he wishes that this fire was already ablaze. He is eager to have this fire be ablaze. The question then becomes, what is this fire that he wants to set the world on? Well, the fire that he wants to give us is the fire of divine love. The fire of divine love. The fire of love that is intense, all-consuming, generative, transformative. The fire of love that is the love that literally the Father and the Son already exchange. The love that is already there between the Father and the Son. That love, that is the very same love that he desires to have burning in the world, to be in each and every one of our hearts. He really desires that. He is eager for that to be in each and every one of us. But then he says, there is something that he needs to do before that can happen. Because even though he desires this burning love to be in the world, this love that is between the Father and the Son to be burning in the world, as of yet in the Gospel of Luke, the world is not yet ready to receive such a love. We cannot stand that love yet. Jesus has to go through a certain baptism in order for him to open the doors so that mankind can receive this love, the earth can receive this love. And what is that baptism that he's speaking about? His passion, death, and resurrection. And so he is in anguish until he can accomplish his passion, death, and resurrection. Because through his passion, death, and resurrection, he's going to open the doors for mankind to have the ability to stand before the face of God and live, to stand before the fire, the raging torrent of divine love and not melt away or die. We see this over and over in the Old Testament. They saw the face of God and, oh, they lived, right? I mean, there's it, that sense that, that the God's presence is so intense, that love is so intense that we can't stand there unless something else happens. And that happens to us through the cross. You see, you and I are able to inco in incorporate or to, to integrate or to receive what Christ has done for us on the cross through our baptism. When we are baptized, we literally die with Christ, as St. Paul tells us in the letter to the Romans. We enter into those waters of baptism and we die with Christ. We die to our old selves. We die to the flesh. And when we come out of those waters of baptism, we are a new creation. We are born again. We are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And we're now living animated by a new principle. We're now living a life of faith. We are recreated, reconstituted. And in a way, we are literally made sons and daughters of God. And that makes us capable of receiving this raging torrent, this fire of divine love. And now we're able to receive the very same love that the Father and the Son share. And this love is nothing short of the Holy Spirit, the fire that is blazing in the world. And as we see even in the Acts of the Apostles, when the disciples receive that fire, they're completely transformed. They're completely transformed. They go on boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus. And up to this day, 2,000 years later in North America, we exist precisely because of the fire of the Holy Spirit that burns in the hearts of those, that burned in the hearts of those apostles and those early disciples. And they've kept that flame ablaze in Jesus Christ even up to this day. And this is what Christ is eager that you and I are able to receive, you and I are able to approach. Now, the fire of divine love is amazing. It is amazing. It literally is like a fire. It not only purifies what is there. It's like what happens with silver and gold when they put it in fire. It burns away the impurities and takes away the dross or anything that doesn't belong. And then the real gold or the real silver begins to shine. That's what divine love does to us when you and I receive it. It burns away what doesn't belong if we're prepared to yield to it. That's the key. If we're prepared to yield to it, it burns away what doesn't belong and what it does is it allows the beauty and the truth of who we are called to be to truly shine. It allows it to shine, but it does burn away the dross and burn away the chaff and the impurities. 
And in a certain sense, we begin to see when we yield to the fire of divine love that there's a division that begins to take place as Jesus is telling us in the gospel today. I have not come to establish peace. I've come to establish division. Now, we know for a fact that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. After all, after his resurrection, that's the first thing that he said, peace be with you. We know he came to establish a peace that surpasses understanding. But in the sense that he's talking about today, he's basically saying the fire of divine love is something that is so radical that when it comes in contact with us who are still fallen because of concupiscence and because of original sin, there is a division that takes place first within ourselves. As we receive the fire of divine love, we begin to notice certain movements within ourselves that don't quite belong, certain tendencies within ourselves that don't quite add up. St. Paul calls that the flesh, our concupiscence, certain unruly passions, tendencies towards sin. We're all sinners, right? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But when we receive the fire of divine love, there's a division. We begin to actually have the tools and the means to wage war against sin within our own members, within our own bodies. We no longer just yield to those passions or yield to those desires of the flesh that we once used to yield to. We begin to actually wage war. There's a, there's a, there's a battle that takes place within every Christian. As St. Paul says, you know, do not give any credence to the flesh. Live according to the Spirit. Even though you're still in the flesh, don't yield to the flesh. Live according to the Spirit. And as we receive the sacraments, we practice the disciplines of the faith, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, that kind of thing, we do battle against the flesh. And in a sense, we already see right there, there's a kind of division. It is in this sense that Jesus Christ is telling us because there are certain things that don't belong and we begin to work to get rid of those things, to put those things to death so that the truth, the beauty, the holiness, the purity that Christ intends through the fire of his divine love becomes manifest in each and every one of us. And that's precisely our journey as Christians to wage war within ourselves against evil, against Satan. That's what we promise at our baptism, to wage war against Satan and the enemy and the, the principle of sin that is within us so that we may emerge through grace victorious and purified and holy as God intends us to be. There's also another sense where Christ comes to bring division. As we grow in holiness and as we receive the fire of this divine love, we think differently. We live differently. The values of the gospel are different necessarily from the values of the world. There's a distinction between the city of God and the city of man. And we see this all the more apparent maybe even in our own culture. And it's not that we go around looking for trouble. It's just sometimes trouble finds us, even if we're not looking for it. Because when we begin to be inspired by the gospel, inspired by Jesus Christ, inspired by the word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, we see things differently. We see things in their fullness of truth. And we begin to realize there are certain things that maybe the culture and the world says are good that are not so good, things that are sinful. And so we begin to point them out and say, that's not good. I don't think that's good for you at the end of the day. That is not true. And so when we say those kinds of things, division. And we see this played out in our first reading today with the story of Jeremiah. It's not that Jeremiah was looking for trouble. The man was a prophet. And the prophet was sent to actually do people good. He was sent to actually tell people the truth so that the will of God may prevail, so that the, 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 the best of what they're supposed to be may be made manifest. And so Jeremiah went and told the people, hey guys, you guys are going about this the wrong way. If you keep doing specifically these things, these things, these things, God is specifically telling us things are not going to work out good for us. So what I'm suggesting is stop doing this, 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 and start doing this, 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 so that God's blessing may come upon us. That's all he was saying. And in response, what do the people say? You ought to be put to death, Jeremiah. How dare you say such a thing? You are demoralizing us. You don't care about us. You are intolerant. You are uninclusive. What is wrong with you? Throw him in a cistern. What did I do? I'm just telling you, like, the truth. 
It's almost like a guy who's standing on the side of the road, maybe a police officer, as you're driving down the highway, and he's like, stop, 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 stop. What? Stop, stop. The road is, is the bridge is taken out down the road. If you keep driving, you're going to fall off a cliff and die. He's warning you, right? And then you look at the guy and say, ah, oh, whatever. You fool, how dare you tell me to stop? <laughs> right? That's what Jeremiah is simply doing. And the people get mad at him for doing that because it's an inconvenient truth they don't want to hear at that time because they're too fun in, too much having fun enjoying their sin. They're too attached to their sin. That's part of the problem. You see, sin can become addictive and we can become like fun but it actually is very self-destructive and we can get attached to it to the point that we love our sin more than the truth and sometimes to the point where we are actually not good for ourselves. And so when somebody tells us, hey, please, let's not do this, it's charity. We're trying to help. But sometimes people don't want to hear that and they get upset at us and then they say, yeah, you're bigots, you're this, you're that, and you're fools, and, you're... and they want to silence us. And I think Jesus, that's what he means here. We come to bring division in the sense that if we're truly living out our faith and the world is the world and the world does the, what the world does, which is sin and all that stuff that is still active in the world, there's going to be friction somewhere. And we necessarily should not necessarily be surprised when we see that friction. And sometimes we even see it in our own families, right? And it's tough. But Jesus is kind of telling us, don't be surprised when you see that friction that division, it's not because we're doing anything wrong. As a matter of fact, it's most likely because we're trying to do what's right. And the key is we keep living out the truth in love. We keep living out the truth in charity. We do our best to show these people, whoever they are, that the truth is lived in love. I can tell you as a priest, there are a certain number of topics that no matter how nicely I try to put it, no matter how nicely I talk about it, somebody will be upset especially hot-button issues in our culture. If I speak about life issues, if I speak about same-sex attraction and that kind of thing, if I speak about those kinds of things, somebody gets upset. If it doesn't fit what the culture says it's supposed to be talked about like, somebody gets upset. It's not even because I'm saying something wrong or bad, it's because they, they want me to say it the way the culture says it, which is actually wrong, and and, and they don't even give it a chance. They don't even give it a chance to listen to what I'm saying because they hear the word, boom, they're triggered, boom, they walk away, how dare you? You didn't say it the way the culture says it, you're a bigot, you're this, and you're like, did you even listen? Did you even hear the words that came out of my mouth? And at the end of the day, I really feel like, especially on these hot button issues, the church's position is very reasonable. Just even using the standard of reasonableness, it makes sense, it's reasonable. Any of the teachings are very compassionate. Sometimes I think we even overly do the compassion to the point that we water it down a little bit, but it's very reasonable. We're not like demanding people to be crazy or weird. We're not like nutcases. We're very reasonable. But the mere mention of some of these things, it causes contention because people don't even want to hear it. And what all we're trying to do is help so that people truly achieve the end for which they are created, that they achieve true happiness, true happiness, truly reach the goal for which they are made for. But because they are ideologies and wacky ideas from our culture, which is now a relativistic culture, which is a contradiction, because they say there is no more truth, which makes no sense. How can there be no more truth? You have your truth, I have my truth. How does that make any sense? Help me understand that. If, is, so, so, so there is no truth? Prove that. Prove that statement, there is no truth. Is that a truth? It makes no sense. But our culture lives like that, and they don't even critically think anymore on these issues. And the moment somebody even says something, they shout you down because they don't know how to argue or to have a conversation anymore. And we've created a generation of people who can't even debate or talk civilly. It's just shouting down and shouting down and shouting down, which is sad. And we have more and more division. And so, brothers and sisters, Live out your faith. Live the truth. Be prophetic like Jeremiah. Speak the truth. Live the truth. And even when we see division, which we know is going to come, don't be surprised. Be charitable. Really allow yourselves to pray about that particular thing, especially if it's somebody you love. Really pray about that and allow that to be an area where the Holy Spirit and the Lord can touch and really allow conversion in your own heart on that particular thing, on that particular issue, so that you can truly be a light 
even for the person who may be causing contention because of the fact that you believe what you believe. And so, as we continue to celebrate this Holy Eucharist, let us allow Christ Jesus to fill us with this Holy Spirit, the fire of his divine love that rages within us. And as it rages within us, may we set the world ablaze on fire so that we can burn away the dross and the impurities of sin in our culture and in our lives so that the holiness of Christ Jesus, the purity of truth, may be made manifest in all its glorious splendor. Praise be Jesus Christ.